Um, I often get asked um, about, you know, Bible studies or books or resources that are helpful to growing um, in your faith, growing in our understanding of God, and besides just reading the Bible and applying that to your life. Um, there is uh, this book right here. Um, it's called Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life, um, written by Donald Whitney. Uh, he's a professor at the Southern Baptist uh, Seminary uh, in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, one of our Southern okay. Baptist Convention um, uh, entities and uh, seminaries. Uh, we have six of those uh, here in the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, this book is... Um, I'm bring you dinner. Let's see here. Uh, back, it was done, first done in 1991. Um, there is a newer edition that came out probably in the last uh, four or five years. Um, and I think it's got a brown cover. Um, you um, would be very encouraged to pick this book up because we're going to use this as kind of a primer for our Bible study together. Um, uh, but even if you, I mean, like I said, we're going to share um, some discussion notes and questions and those kinds of things with you every week uh, to help us guide our study. Our study. This is a great book just to go, just to have in your repertoire, in your catalog, if you will. There's also a secondary um, uh, kind of a study guide that goes with it. So uh, you can purchase both of those. A lot of the questions that I'm going to share are in here, and you are more than welcome to uh, use that um, as we go along. It's uh, actually very helpful. Um, Let's see, I saw Erin kind of raise her hand for a second. Yeah, Denise said they're trying to get in right now, but they had the wrong password. So she asked, so I'm just trying to let you know to uh, watch. Um, keeping an eye out for anybody else that's trying to get in. Um, oh, there it is, there's Denise. Hey Denise, welcome, welcome. Again, uh, this is the uh, main book that we're using uh, to kind of guide our study. It is not completely necessary for you to purchase it and follow along, but it is well worth the uh, 10 to $12 that you would spend on it. And so I, I encourage you to, to pick it up just because the, uh, the information and instruction in here is just so useful. And then also, too, um, there is a uh, study guide that goes along with this, and you can use that. Now, if you look in the chat section of this, uh, um, of this Zoom meeting, there is a, um, uh, the handout that we, that we sent to you. Hey, friends. Um, and uh, you are more than welcome to download that and follow along. Uh, there is the outline that we'll go over together, but then also, too, there's about uh, 12 questions uh, worth of discussion, maybe even homework, if you wanted to consider that. So i um, trying to do everything I can to make it accessible for everyone. And uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and um, uh, pray, and then we'll dive right into the Bible study together, okay? Um, <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I ask that you would um, help us to be encouraged and help us to be uh, faithful to your task of understanding you and understanding um, what it means to trust in you, to serve you completely. Uh, I pray, Lord, that um, we would use these spiritual disciplines that uh, you're showing us to um, uh, strengthen ourselves and, and make us more like your son Jesus and make us more like um, your, uh, uh, like you want us to be, like you've created us uh, to be, that we might serve you faithfully and freely and that we might be able to apply um, the same passion for your kingdom to the way that we interact with people around us, those that we know, those that we love, and even the strangers that we might meet, that many would know what it is to walk in your ways and uh, be with you forever. Lord, I, I ask that you would um, uh, make these things true uh, in our hearts and in our lives, that uh, this time of study and discipleship would be an encouragement uh, for us all. 
So, Lord, we thank you for everything that you are. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right. As we start off, we should be able to see kind of a uh, the PowerPoint uh, for this uh, Bible study. And um, I was, uh, I wanted to kind of, um, since many, I don't know if you guys are going to go ahead and get the book, but I'm assuming that, uh, that you guys will and follow along. And so I, I kind of wanted to, to spend a few moments just kind of recapping everything, or I guess not recapping, but really going over uh, what it is. Um, the book is laid out in, in a way that uh, kind of talks about what the spiritual disciplines are and why we should follow them. That's what we're going to talk about right now, like what, what their purpose is. But then uh, week by week, um, chapter by chapter, they're broken up into the different types of spiritual disciplines. And so there's everything from Bible intake to prayer, worship, evangelism, serving, stewardship, fasting, uh, and the list goes on. Um, we're going to do our best to kind of just go faithfully through week to week. And this uh, Bible study should last us about 12 weeks to kind of give us a, a kind of a refresher uh, or even maybe just a primer of where we are, of, of how to follow him and, and what we should do. Um, and so uh, one of the things that I wanted us to start out with um, is this, uh, um, what is the purpose of God, uh, of, of spiritual disciplines? And what I think that it is, is for the purpose of godliness. And I think that that's what the book teaches us. Um, it's actually the first chapter. Um, and uh, I wanted us to start out mainly because this is probably going to be um, a little bit strange, but I wanted to read to you the way that the book starts, okay? And um, I, I think that if we could uh, follow along, listen along as I read the first kind of intro to you, uh, maybe we would get to an understanding of, of why we're undertaking this, right? Um, he starts out, the author, uh, Dr. Whitney, says, discipline without direction is drudgery. Imagine six-year-old Kevin, whose parents have enrolled him in music lessons. After school, every afternoon, he sits in the living room and reluctantly strums Home on the Range while watching his buddies play baseball in the park across the street. That's discipline without direction. It's drudgery. Now, suppose Kevin is visited by an angel one afternoon during guitar practice. In a vision, he's taken to Carnegie Hall. He's shown a guitar virtuoso giving a concert. Usually bored by classical music, Kevin is astonished by what he sees and hears. The musician's fingers dance excitedly on the strings with fluidity and grace. Kevin thinks of how stupid and clunky his hands feel when they halt and stumble over the chords. The virtuoso blends clean, soaring notes into a musical aroma that wafts uh, from his guitar. Kevin remembers the toneless, irritating discord that comes stumbling out of his guitar. But Kevin is enchanted. His head tilts slightly to one side as he listens, and he drinks everything in. He never imagined that anyone could play the guitar like this. The angel asks him, what do you think, Kevin? The soft answer of the slow uh, six-year-old is, wow. The vision vanishes, and the angel is again standing in front of Kevin in his living room. And the angel says to him, Kevin, that wonderful musician you saw is you in just a few short years. And then pointing at the guitar, the angel declares, but you must practice. Friends, I think that's exactly where we find ourselves when it comes to discipline. And whether we're trying to lose weight or uh, learn an instrument or learn a new language or any of those things, I think that what we see often is a, um, we, we have excitedness about getting involved. We have excitedness about uh, trying to uh, learn all these different things and what's happening and how, how uh, this new skill is going to play into our life and those kinds of things. But then we, um, 
we get into the mundane and the routine of it and it just becomes drudgery. It becomes difficult and it's not exciting as when the first day you unwrap that new instrument or pulled out that textbook to learn the new skill or language or whatever it is. And I think that we have to push ourselves with that. I, I hear often people say, oh man, I wish I could go back to when I first heard from God, when I first experienced him. And we look back fondly to those days and maybe you remember sitting at your parents' uh, foot to hear them explain or maybe you were involved in a vacation Bible school where the, the, the story of Jesus just came alive and became so clear to you. Uh, maybe you were at a youth camp or some sort of retreat with uh, other men or women and, 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 and you just had this time where you felt God using you and speaking to you and calling you out. And then the years have passed and the days have gone by and you no longer think of those things anymore. The distractions of this world and the difficulty that we find ourselves in um, becomes hard and becomes painful, um, becomes a drudgery. And so what I want us to get to is this idea that Spiritual dis disciplines for the Christian life are necessary, and they are meant for the purpose of making us more like God, building in us godliness. Dr. Whitney starts his book with this idea that the only road to Christian maturity and godliness passes through the practice of the spiritual disciplines. The only road to Christian maturity and godliness passes through the practice of the spiritual disciplines. Now we know that God is the one that powers us, that the Holy Spirit is the one that comforts us and sustain, sustains us. We understand that it's him doing all the work, but we also understand that we have to be active in our participation. We have to be uh, willing in our uh, ability to follow him and to be changed by him. And when I think about maturity, um, uh, Christian maturity, in the same way that an athlete becomes more mature, I think about my kids and they've played soccer uh, most of their lives. Uh, they both started out really, really young, four or five years old. And they started on that small little field with just a few players and the rules were really loose, you know, to try to give them instruction. And as they've progressed, you know, they've, they've gotten to a, a larger size ball and a larger size field and the referees really start calling fouls and, and doing all of those things. And what, what, where a, a handball maybe was let to pass now is being called more uh, fervently. And even to where Parker is now, where as, a, as an 11 year old, this past year playing on the full-size field with the, the full-size ball and 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 all of those different things and in the way in the same way that you mature as an athlete or mature as a, a skilled technician or any uh, a musician or whatever it is um, we have to mature in um, our our faith and in our faithfulness in our godliness maturity is a lifetime journey of small steps and large leaps I think that we see um, in our own life that, you know, we, we have to take these small steps, do the little things. We have to be able to uh, repeat the same practice over and over and over again. But then also, too, we have to make those large leaps and those large slide, strides that help us um, understand him, understand God more, that help us understand uh, his faithfulness and his uh, uh mercy and grace and the truth of who he is um i think that it's it's extremely important for us to to keep that in mind that we don't you know that moment when we're first called by god is not everything that we're ever going to receive but that we grow in our faith we mature over a lifetime it really is a journey and remember how even in the experiencing god uh, bible study we talked about that how that we we it, it, we progress as we go, and the deeper that we know Him, the farther we walk with Him, the more real our experience with Him becomes. And so uh, we see that maturity is a lifetime journey of small steps and large leaps. We see also too that godliness is a lifetime job of obedience to the commands of God. Uh, 
I, I feel sometimes that we're beating a dead horse with this, but um, I, I don't think that you can. Obedience has always been something that God has required of man, that he created us in his image and that he gave us commands and he gave us charges and he expected us to follow them. He expected us to have a relationship with him, to, uh, to know him intimately, but also to keep his commandments. And we failed miserably from the very start. And uh, we failed miserably throughout all of history up until these moments. And in the future, we're still going to fail miserably because we're broken and because there's still work to be done. It's a lifetime job. It's a lifetime commitment. It is a responsibility and uh, it is us needing to find in him the purpose for our lives, always keeping uh, keeping um, this obedience forefront, um, this godliness um, that comes from holiness, right? That, that when we talk about God and his character, we think of his love and we think of his power. We think of his omnipresence and uh, we think of uh, his justice. We think of his mercy and grace and all of these different things. But it all stems from his holiness, that he is a holy God without flaw, without mistake, without blemish. And we, uh, because he's holy, we should strive to uh, be like him, to be godly. And so, friends, if we really want to um, be mature uh, and be uh, godly, then we need to practice the spiritual disciplines. We need to practice the spiritual disciplines. Um, the spiritual disciplines are the means to godliness. They are the means to godliness. And we practice spiritual disciplines on two separate fronts. Uh, first, we practice the spiritual disciplines personally. Uh, the spiritual disciplines in a, a personal way are what every believer does on their own to look more like Christ. That, that we should uh, engage in Bible reading uh, and applying it to our lives. We should engage in prayer and fasting and serving and, and on and on and on these spiritual disciplines that are outlined for us so that we look more like Christ. When it says, when, when Jesus said to us to make disciples, um, he gave us the standard, teach them to obey all that I have commanded. And all that he has commanded is literally everything in the word of God, that he has given us his word. He has given us the Bible that we might apply his truth and his commands to our lives and to ourselves so that we look more like him. How often did Jesus say, um, follow me, uh, do as I do, take my yoke upon you. He, he wants us to be like him in every way conceivable. Every single believer does on their own the spiritual disciplines so that we might look more like Christ. But also, too, the spiritual disciplines, they're a means of godliness in the corporate sense. Every church comes together and does together to serve Christ more faithfully. Uh, we were not meant to be islands. We were not meant to be by ourselves, little silos out there just, you know, doing the things of God and trying to uh, do our best for him. We were meant to come together as the church, as the gathered ones, as the set apart ones, so that we might have purpose in each other, that we might have help and uh, uh, submission and um, uh, this, this, the ability for us to grow uh, together so that we might serve Christ faithfully. Uh, Paul in the book of Ephesians talks about how that happens in those interpersonal uh, relationships through, uh, he gives like the example of husband and wives, the way that they interact should be like Christ in the church. Uh, children and parents are, are an example for Christ and his uh, chosen. The, uh, the slaves and their masters are another way that we can submit and obey one another so that we look like Christ. The relationship that we have uh, with other people is so paramount. What have we learned over these past eight, nine weeks as we've been separated from each other? That we miss the community. That the hardest part of any of this, you know, I mean, yes, people are sick and uh, 
folks are losing their jobs and, and, and I don't mean to make light of any of those things, but, but how many of us have just in, in, in a moment of just pure, uh, frustration said i just miss seeing other people i miss hugging i miss interacting uh how true is it that the spiritual disciplines uh are that means of godliness in our lives that that by applying them personally and uh using them corporately we grow to look more like christ and serve him more faithfully and so these spiritual disciplines of Bible uh, intake of uh, prayer, uh, fasting, of giving, and on all and all the other ones that we're going to talk about in the coming weeks, um, they are meant for us to do and apply to our own lives personally, but also to to make sure that we are engaging in them uh, corporately with the rest of the church, with the rest of the body of believers, and uh, what a what a great joy that can be for us. Now. Um, when we talk about the spiritual disciplines, uh, we see that they are a means for godliness, but we also see that the Lord expects them. The Lord expects us to show fruit, to show change, so that we might look more like his son, that we might follow uh, him and be uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. The Lord expects us to be like that, to, to look, look more like him. He expects us to have these um, spiritual disciplines in our lives so that we might understand him more. So that we might uh, follow him more uh, closely and 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 serve him more faithfully. Um, that passage there from First Peter chapter one is a reminder of uh, back when Leviticus, where um, God says, "You must be holy, for I am holy." Um, and we 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 trust that that because God is holy, He's calling us out to be different, to be set apart. Um, I've seen many times um, where folks uh, say to me, uh, well, pastor, I follow God and I made a decision. I walked an aisle. I signed a card. I did. I was dunked under the waters. And I mean, you, there's lots of different things. And finally, I'm done. I can just sit back and rest. And, and they, they sometimes don't say it in those kinds of just frank terms, but if you boil it down, it's like, well, I've got the good at, I got the get out of jail free card. And so woo, I'm, I'm set. But Christ calls us to follow him. Um, and that call is for our lifetime that we should be changed. Um, there's a process to us becoming more like Christ, and it, it exists in three different ways, um, or three different phases. I guess famously it's been taught this way, uh, through justification, through sanctification, and through glorification. So as we think about how God expects them from us, uh, think about how we are justified, that as the Lord expects these spiritual disciplines of us, uh, it first happens in justification. Justification. Now, justification is where we are free from the penalty of sin. That happens in an instant. That God uh, sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for your sins and my sins. In fact, the whole sins of uh, the sins of the whole world. And that Jesus went and beat sin and beat death and left them at the gates of hell so that they that he had complete victory rose over the uh, rose from the grave and and uh, now in both spiritual terms and in physical terms he has both victory over life and death um victory over sin and shame guilt and uh, accusation and for those that confess Jesus to be Lord and serve him and follow his ways, that they are justified in a moment, that they are free from the penalty of sin and that sin no longer is a weight on them. And that's the first step. And many people might find themselves justified, but stop there. But who would take a recipe and only do the first couple of steps and say, well, I've got this, I've preheated the oven and I've mixed everything. And then just, there it is. No, we have to go through the process of sanctification, which is next. Sanctification is the freedom from the power of sin. And what I mean by that is that we um, look more like Jesus every day. That in the process of sanctification, that's when we get 
uh, those hard edges sanded smooth and those wayward thoughts uh, cleared out and that uh, sin that holds us down uh, gets released and, and, and shedded and, and moved away. This, the process of sanctification is to is literally means to be made holy, to be sanctified, cleansed and, and, and made ready for use by God. And the more that he uses us, the more that he makes us worthy of his use. And the more that he makes us worthy of his, of, of his use, he uses us again. And it is a continuous cycle. And while we still have breath and we are faithfully following Christ, following God in our, and with those breaths, uh, God will continue to sanctify us as we move along. So justification is that freedom from the penalty of sin in that instant we're changed and we are justified, forgiven. The righteousness of Christ is assigned to us, covers us, and our sins have been washed away. But we're still alive, we're still breathing, and so we still have to go through our days. And that's when the process of being made holy happens. And until our final breath, until we get to the last stage, God will still be working on us. And that final stage is glorification. Glorification where we are free from the presence of sin. That when we die, or when Jesus comes back, whichever one would happen first in our, in our lifetime, Either, either of those two events would enter us into uh, where we would be with heaven and like uh, be with God in heaven. And like Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise, right? Because he was going to die, <laughs> the thief was. And at his death, because he was justified in his forgiveness, his sanctification process was just <laughs> very, very short there on the cross. But his glorification was instant in the moment. Today you'll be with me in paradise. And in that same way that happens with us. Now, friends, from justification until glorification, we have this process of sanctification that God is actively working in our lives. That is what the spiritual disciplines are for, that God is expecting us to use those spiritual disciplines to look more like his son. He is expecting us to pray and read the scripture, to worship him uh, uh, as a body, to come together corporately, to give and to serve and to uh, all of those different things that we're going to speak of in the coming weeks, uh, we are expected to do them. So spiritual disciplines are the means for godliness. They are expected by God. But then also, too, I want us to give us a, a few uh, warnings and um, uh, encouragements as, as we wrap this up. Uh, first, I want us to see that there's danger in neglecting there's danger in neglecting the spiritual disciplines. In the same way that an unhealthy diet and lack of exercise will lead to an unhealthy body, then we will need, you know, then we can suffer as spiritual beings and as spiritual people. In the same way that a mus musician kind of loses their ability if they don't practice and if they don't pay attention and if they don't put in the hard work. In the same way that, uh, you know, a computer programmer uh, gets, you know, uh, surpassed because the technology is always changing. If all the computer, co imagine if a computer programmer reached his pinnacle or her pinnacle in the year 1997, right? Right as Apple is releasing their iMac and all those different things and they're learning it all, but then they decided never to learn anything else again. They got their degree, they got their certificate, and how different is life uh, in the computer world uh, compared back in 1997 to where we sit today? And in the same way as our lives continue to grow and develop and we experience new things, then friends, it is important for us to pay attention that the spiritual disciplines of this world, uh, or, or of this life, uh, if we neglect them, we are treading in dangerous waters. We are treading in dangerous waters by ne neg neglecting them. But the excitement is that there's freedom in embracing the spiritual disciplines. There's freedom in embracing the spiritual disciplines. Why is there freedom in structure? Because structure sets you free. Uh, how often... Uh, 
with our kids that just today, they had a really hard time uh, with, with uh, this morning. We were trying to give them a little bit of direction and we made, made the mistake of saying, hey, why don't you guys go do an art project? Now, my kiddos are smart and creative kids and they uh, do some amazing things, right? But to say, go and do an art project, I mean, their heads were spinning. And Emerson's like, well, I can paint or, or I could maybe cut something out or I could do this or I could, and she, she was like, what should I do? And she couldn't really get there. And so what we did was we showed her a few things that she could do and we gave her some instruction and she made a really cool pop-up little doggy that uh, made out of construction paper. And it's, it's so cute. I wish I had it here to show you. But we gave her some structure. We gave her some purpose. We gave her uh, that, that kind of that freedom within the, the, um, the, the structure of a, a particular task, and she went after it. And after she went after it and did that one, she wanted to do another one, and she wanted to make something else. And, and you could see how that creativity started just blossoming even more, and where she was thinking about painting this or uh, designing that or doing all these other things. It was all focused into, hey, I can do these things, these specific things. And friends, that's the same way that it here that we are uh, as as believers in God and followers of Him. That we want to say, hey, just hey, do your best and try to know God, and I hope it all works out for you. What what will that do for us? Uh, we will we'll look at so many different things, and we 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 won't have structure, we won't have purpose, we won't have that kind of uh, clarity that comes through knowing that there's these spiritual disciplines that we can engage in. And take, for example, spirit, the spiritual discipline of reading the Bible. You know, if we were to just pull out, hey, oh, well, I'm going to read from First Peter today and then close the Bible and then tomorrow just kind of open up where it falls. And here I am in Proverbs now. And then I close that up and the next day I open up. Well, now I'm in First Samuel and then, oh, I'm in the Hebrews and you just go back and forth. I mean, imagine how that would be. But then, but instead... You can see how the Bible has a little bit of order to it in the stories that we read and we read the Gospels and, and the Gospels give way to how the church was built and the church gives way, uh, how the church was built with, gives way to the, the epistles and, and so on and so forth. And we see how the, old, the New Testament quotes the Old Testament so many times and, and how the, New, the Old Testament speaks about the truth of the New Testament, even though it didn't know it yet. And if you look at the structure that's in there, the, the specificity and, and the help, it can direct us and guide us. Imagine if you just prayed every, every time that you prayed and you just kind of, well, thanks for the wall and thanks for the, uh, the frogs outside that eat the grasshoppers and thank, you know, and you just, you just, I mean, those are sweet little prayers and we should be thankful for all the things that God does, of course, but uh, without the structure, without the, 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 the help of the disciplines giving us that that ability to go back again and know where the next thing progresses and the building of things going um we see how um we we would lose sight and and be very distracted but because the the spiritual disciplines build within us muscle memory and spiritual muscle memory that we can go back to the things that we've already learned and the things that we've already discovered so that we might move forward in faithfulness. Um, reminded of these passages here where it talks about, hey, when I was a child, I did things like a child. But now that I am older, I have put away the childish things and I, I look to see what God is showing me as I mature in my faithfulness to him. And friends, there's freedom in that that pushes us into the next step, into the next part of our uh, spiritual growth. The spiritual disciplines give us freedom as we embrace them. Now, lastly, as we think about this, there's an invitation for all Christians to enjoy the spiritual disciplines. We look at these passages here where Christ calls us and says, follow me, take on my yoke, look exactly like I look and see what amazing things I can do through you and for you and with you. The spiritual disciplines are there and, and they're accessible. I think to how one of the things that Jesus did before he ascended into heaven, besides giving us the 
um, uh, the Great Commission, was it, uh, the Bible tells us that, that God or that Jesus opened our minds to understand right? That, that we could under, understand and interpret the scripture. I think about Jesus as he's walking on that road to Emmaus with the two disciples. And it says that starting from the very beginning, he went and explained to them all the things that he'd heard and how, oh yeah, it makes sense now that we've seen Christ and that we know that he's, he's, he's resurrected. Friends, there's an invitation for us as Christians to follow God but also to see these spiritual disciplines as a way to find that abundant life living in the truth that is Christ. And if we can focus on that, uh, I think that we will see these spiritual disciplines as being something that is uh, helpful to all of us. Now, this is what I want to do with our remaining minutes, just a, just a few minutes here. I'd like you to, to turn with me to uh um first timothy first timothy chapter four um and we're gonna look at verse six as you find your your scripture there uh, first timothy chapter uh, four uh verse six says this if you put these things before the brothers you will be a good servant of christ jesus now Paul here is encouraging Timothy on how to be a leader, how to be a pastor, how to be an elder that encourages the body. He says that you're going to be trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. Uh, another translation might say, discipline yourself for godliness. For godliness, it says, for while bodily training is of some value, this is verse 8, godliness is of value in every way. I think back to all of the push-ups and sit-ups and workouts that you might have done, and only to see if, if you haven't kept up with them, how has that gone by the wayside, you know, and, and how uh, broken down your body can be if you're not faithful to that. But the spiritual pursuit of godliness is in value of every way, the scripture says. It says it holds the promise for the present life and also the life to come. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, verse 10. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift that you have with which was given you by prophecy with the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And friends, if these things can be true for Timothy, a faithful servant of God, a faithful follower of the Lord, how can they not be true for us? That for us to obey the teachings of Christ, to put them into action, to train ourselves, to toil, to practice, to strive in these spiritual disciplines of reading scripture, of uh, teaching, exhorting, uh, all of these things that we've learned through good, solid doctrine. If we don't, if we fail to put them into practice, what will we have to show for it? But by putting them into practice and keeping close watch on ourselves so that we might live these out in a real and tangible way, we might, we will, it says that we will save both ourselves and those that are hearing of us. Friends, for us, that's our family and our friends who see our example and hear the testimony of our hearts. That's our, um, that's our coworkers who um, maybe even though distant from God will see in us living faithfully and being disciplined in the spiritual ways so that they might be encouraged to walk with him. 
that's in our evangelism as we go and we spread the good news and we give an honest account of what we believe they'll see the truth in our hearts and understand the veracity of our testimony and they might be changed by the work of the holy spirit because we've been willing to be faithful to him friends as we think about what the spiritual disciplines are they are the means that we use to gain godliness god himself expects them of us we live in dangerous territory if we start to neglect them but we have freedom as we embrace them and apply them to our lives and heart friends i want us to leave us this evening with that idea that there is an invitation for each and every one of us to join in these spiritual disciplines so that we might know him more that we might understand him more fully let us not be discouraged in these things but let us try uh, always seek to um, imitate christ being filled with the spirit and as we close our time together let me encourage you in this way please that this is no small task. I, I, we've called this Christianity 101 because I was tired of trying to come up with a better uh, title for it because really it's just getting down to the brass tacks. We've talked about what it is to experience God and to really experience him, what do we have to do in our own lives that can be tangible and useful so that we might look more like him with every step that we take. And friends, let me encourage you that these disciplines that we're going to learn, uh, reading the Bible, how to read the Bible, um, prayer, worship, evangelism, serving, stewardship, fasting, silence and solitude, journaling, uh, learning, and then perseverance. All of these disciplines are going to help us look more like Christ and be filled with his spirit so that we might walk with God and experience him to the fullest this christian life is not meant to be easy it's not meant to be simple uh, well let me say this it's not meant to be easy but it is simple it simply we die to ourselves and follow christ and trust in him for what he's leading us and how he's leading us friends that is where we should be going that is what we should be doing that should be our chief end let me encourage you to download the copy of that uh, handout. Um, if you can't see it because you're like on an iPad or something like that, uh, check out our website, Wednesday Night Digital, and there's a link to it right there underneath the Zoom meeting page, and, and you can download that. It'll give you a copy of the outline that we just went through, but also, too, it'll have about 12 questions that you can do as homework for uh, reflection time and be encouraged in that. Um, I uh, strongly recommend uh, purchasing the book, uh, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life by Donald Whitney. Uh, it is a great resource. Um, it is one that has been a great encouragement to me and, and helped me. Um, and uh, there is the accompanying study guide that goes along with it. Uh, both of these are available on Kindle, if you're that kind of person that likes to do it digitally. Um, let, me, let me close with this one last quote, if I can. It's uh, from uh, old Tom Landry. Now, I'm not a big fan of the Dallas Cowboys, but uh, I like Tom Landry. He was a good Christian man. He said this, the job of a football coach is to make men do what they don't want to do in order to achieve what they've always wanted to be. And in the same way, the job of Christ is to change us so that we who wanted to pursue sin uh, would be changed, that we always wanted to be with him in heaven, uh, that we would go through that transformation. And if we keep our eyes on Christ following his playbook, uh, following his word and putting in the practice of the spiritual disciplines, um, nothing can stand against our church. Uh, nothing can stand against us who are powered by God and he will be with us always. Let us pray over these things. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would help us to work out, exercise our faith, develop these spiritual muscles and disciplines that would make us look more like your son, Jesus. 
Lord, may we not be satisfied that we're justified and just sit back and enjoy the fruits of your blessing. But Lord, let us dive deep into the work of sanctification that we might look more like your son made holy uh, for his purposes, doing his will. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be encouraged in this, that we might trust in you completely and might, we might follow you um, all of our days. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen.